Well, g'day, curd nerds. No, it's not Darje Vu. I've had to re-release this Fundy Fog video because the audio was out of sync. So my mouth was moving and there was no sound coming out. So, uh, oh, and it was out of sync. So it was like three seconds later. Anyway, you may have enjoyed the first one. However, me being the well, slight perfectionist when it comes down to videos and making sure they look good and people understand the cheese making process, I thought I'd re-release this one and add this little bit at the start of the video. Anyway, welcome to the Fundy Fog video. Over to Gav. Well, g'day curd nerds. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be making a new cheese called Fundy Fog. Now, Fundy Fog is a twist on Humboldt Fog, which is a Californian goat's cheese that has an ash line down the middle. Now, this cheese does have an ash line down the middle, but it is a cow's milk cheese. Now, we don't know if the flavour is the same as Humboldt Fog, but it looks the same. And we've taken all measures necessary to make it taste a little bit goaty. Now, when I say we... I mean the author of the recipe, who is Patricia Gauchi. So thank you, Patricia, for sending the recipe to me after having invented this cheese or this variation on Humboldt Fog. Now, like I said, it is not Humboldt Fog. If anybody's out there thinking of a cease and desist, it is Fundy Fog. Now, it's named after the Bay of Fundy in Halifax, around Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, so... The cheese is absolutely unique and the flavour is amazing. I have tasted it and there is a taste test at the end of this video. Stick with me. I did make one slight mistake that I'll say up front. I salted the cheese incorrectly. I put too much salt on the top and bottom and I didn't salt the sides of the cheese. Now I should have done because what happened is the mould didn't grow as well on the top and bottom as it did the sides. Penicillium candidum and Geotrichum candidum, which are the two moulds that I use for this cheese, do not like too much salt and they don't grow where there is too much salt on the cheese. So that's a tip for newbies, including silly people like myself, who sometimes forget the rules of cheese making, if there are any rules, of course. Anyway, enough waffling from me. Let's get on and see how we made Fundy Fog by Patricia Gauchi. Start off by sanitizing all of your equipment. I've got mine all laid out after I've sanitized it there. And the milk I'm using today is unhomogenized but pasteurized milk from Inglenook Dairy. So the Fundy Fog ingredients are 8 litres or 2 gallons of whole cow's milk, 1 quarter of a teaspoon of Floridanica aromatic mesophilic starter culture, 1 eighth of a teaspoon of Penicillium candidum. 1 32nd of a teaspoon of Geotrichum candidum. 1 16th of a teaspoon of lipase. Now, if you can get kid lipase, that's fantastic. That's diluted in quarter of a cup of water, non-chlorinated water. A quarter of a teaspoon or 1.25 mils of calcium chloride diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. 3 eighths of a teaspoon or 2 milliliters of single strength rennet diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. I'm using IMCU Strength 200. One teaspoon of non-iodized salt per cheese and some cheese ash. So heat your milk using whatever method you want. I'm using the uh, precision cooker and heat it up to 32 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Just checking the temperature there, it looks very close, spot on actually. So first step, we're going to add the calcium chloride solution to the milk and give that a good stir. That adds back some soluble calcium into the milk to help it set a better curd. We're going to add the lipase well before we add the rennet. So add that in second ingredient and give that a good stir. Now 
Now we're going to add the Flora Danica and just sprinkle that over the surface. And now we're going to add the Penicillium Candidum, sprinkle that over the surface as well. And then we're going to add the Geotrichum Candidum. There we go. Put the lid back on and we're going to allow that to rehydrate for five minutes. So five minutes later, we're now going to stir the cultures into the milk. So just checking the temperature there, it's spot on still, which is good. Now allow the milk to ripen for 90 minutes or an hour and a half. So after the milk has acidified slightly, just give that a stir to stir any cream back in. Now we're going to add the final ingredient, the rennet. So add the rennet solution and give that a stir for no more than one minute. So pop the lid back on and we're going to allow that to set for 60 minutes. So after 60 minutes, it should have coagulated. And we're going to check that by doing a clean break. So put your knife in, turn it 45 degrees, and if it splits cleanly, then it's ready to cut. So cut it into 1.25 centimeter or half inch cubes. Now I did use my stainless steel curd harp to do the horizontals and the verticals, the knife. So allow the curds now to heal for 10 minutes. This stops them from fracturing when you first stir them. So after 10 minutes, you can see a little bit of whey on top. That's normal. And we're going to stir the curds gently for 15 minutes. Now, if there are any curds that are too large, just break them with the edge of your spoon as you stir and stir and stir. So after 15 minutes, you can see the uh, curds are a little bit smaller, not too small. This is a fairly moist sort of cheese. That's why we only stir for a short amount of time. So I'm going to pop the lid back on again, and we're going to allow that to settle to the bottom for 10 minutes. So after the 10 minutes, just remove all the heating devices and drain the water out. We don't need that anymore. Take the lid off. Say hello to the doggos and move the baskets that I'm using. I'm using chamomile baskets, they're 10 centimeters. We're gonna dip off the way now to the level of the curds. Now Patricia's recipe, she used 11 and a half um, centimeter molds i've only got 10 centimeter so i had to add a third basket in so just ladle the curds into your baskets evenly there we go up to the tippy top now i've found that there are so much curds left over because of the smaller size baskets i'm using there so i decided to add a third basket and all i had at hand that was sanitized was a one that was a little bit bigger, but all worked out okay. Now it took me about 60 minutes to use up all of the curds. Just keep ladling it in as the curds drop there. Now this is time-lapse obviously, um, and it is dropping quite quickly, but it took a while, mark my words. All right, so allow 60 minutes for them to now drain further. You can see they've shrunk a little bit. Now, they're firm enough because we did stir the curds, so you can flip them in the basket. If you're using a hoop, then just as easy to flip them as well. Obviously, I've got clean hands when I do all of this. I uh, wash them in hot soapy water and vinegar. Allow them to drain for another 60 minutes. 
So 60 minutes later, I'm just going to flip the cheeses over again. And they're going to be a little bit firmer. So it makes it a bit easier. So allow them to drain for another 60 minutes. So I'm going to flip the cheeses in the basket every hour for a total of six hours. Now that includes the two flippings we've already done. So you can see that they're shaping up nicely and they've got no rough edges. So once you've done that full six hours, then allow them to drain overnight. So the next day for me, just going to clean up the board a little bit. Now with a sharp knife, or uh, Patricia suggests some dental floss, you cut each cheese in half around the circumference of the cheese. So watch what I do here. So I'll take one out, and I scored it a little bit. I wasn't too sure about how sharp the knife was but it was razor sharp so you can score it all the way around if you want to however you get a cleaner cut if you just push straight through now if you're using dental floss you'll get a nice clean cut all the way through as well or a cheese wire even there we go two equal sized halves and repeat with the other one or two cheeses that you have go so make sure you put on some gloves and we're going to sprinkle on a fine layer of the uh, the cheese ash or activated charcoal onto one half of each of the cheeses now I use a t-ball and I find this works very well you we don't get too much of a mess so start from the center and work your way out Now I used about one teaspoon of ash for all three cheeses for this middle part. There we go. So a nice fine coating of ash. Now what we do, we put the ash half facing upwards into the basket it came from, so you can see the ash. And then we put the cut half down so it's on top of the ash in the basket and repeat that with the other cheeses. There we go. Now it doesn't matter if it leaks out the sides because we're gonna coat all the cheeses with more ash later on. Now we need these to weld together so that the two halves don't separate. So I'm just putting a little food umbrella over the top, stop any beasties getting into the cheese and allow that to drain overnight. So flip the cheeses in the basket about every 12 hours for a total of three to four days or until they are firm and melded together. So a lot of whey still coming off. So this is day one. So I'll be, I was very gentle when I flipped them over to make sure they didn't separate. Pop the old trusty umbrella back on and come back in 12 hours. So day two, you can see they're not leaking as much whey and they're a little bit easier to flip, but still be careful. So I did this morning and night. And then day three, they're a lot firmer and they're drained a lot better. A lot easier to handle. Now I had them on a tray just to move them off the uh, sink area so we could actually cook. So day four this is and there's very little moisture on the outside and they don't come apart so that's good. I'm just flipping them over one last time before salting. So 
So I get out my trusty cheese salt and we're going to apply half a teaspoon of the salt to the top surface of each cheese and then we're going to rub it over the top. Just gently. Now because there's still a lot of moisture on the cheese, uh, not as much as when we first started flipping, but there is some moisture there, some whey. Uh, this creates a little brine solution on top of the cheese. And that helps soak into the cheese. So we do one side. Uh, Patricia in her recipe states 10 minutes, uh, but I chose to do two hours because I know I wanted a bit more salt absorption. So I left them for two hours and then came back to them. Now this did create a nice little brine on top and I should have rubbed it all over the sides at this stage as well. But flip the cheeses over. Then half a teaspoon each again on each side. On the top, that is. There we go. Perfect. So I allow that to absorb for another two hours. So what I should have done here, and I don't show it, uh, I should have rubbed the salt brine that's now formed all over the cheese, and this would avoid the balding issue, the mistake that I made. So I should have rubbed it all over now. Anyway, so uh, remove the cheese from the basket and then sprinkle all surfaces with ash. So start on one side and then flip it on its side and then just put ash all over. It doesn't have to be perfect, just has got a slight coating on it. What this does, this neutralizes the pH of the surface of the cheese and allows the white moulds, the two white moulds, to grow very well indeed on the surface of the cheese. So just do the best you can. Probably used about two to three teaspoons of ash for all these three cheeses. So pop them in a ripening box, as you can see there. Make sure they're separated because they need a little bit of room to breathe. And when the mold does grow, you don't want them sticking to each other. So we're going to mature them at 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit at 90% relative humidity. And we're going to flip them every two days to prevent them from sticking to the mat. At this stage, we're waiting for a mold growth all over the cheese. Now, this is day 21. Uh, due to too much salt, you can see that they are a little bit bald. And I chose not to wrap them because I wanted to see if I could get a, a full covering. Now, if you have a good mould covering and you've done the salting correctly, not like me, then it's time to wrap the cheeses and you can do that now. However, I just turned them and left them to mature for the full 60 days it takes for this cheese to ripen. So you continue to mature the fundy fog at 10 degrees Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit at 90% relative humidity for 60 days. Now over to Gav. So we waited for uh, 60 days and the fundy fog is ready. Now I didn't get around to wrapping them, uh, but they are nonetheless done as far as I'm concerned. Now you'll probably notice that, yes, it has got white mold all over except on the top and a little bit on the bottom. Now, I didn't wrap them on purpose because I was still waiting for the mould to grow. Now, after 60 days, it's going to be a little bit runny underneath the surface of the, the cheese. Uh, and the reason why I didn't grow uh, the mould on the top was because I salted it too heavily. Uh, and uh, Penicillium candidum and Geotrichum candidum don't particularly like a lot of salt. So that was my problem. So when I salted the top and the bottom, of the cheese, what I should have done is, yeah, sure, salted the top and bottom, but then rubbed it all over. Uh, and then it would have been a better 
all-round sort of cheese. So, what's it going to look like inside? Well, that's, that's the big thing with this Fundy Fog. It's got a line of ash through the middle, and let's see if we can't see that without getting too much ooziness on the outside and dragging. Oh, that looks pretty good. There we go. Look at that. That is spectacular. And you don't get a lot of, there's a little bit of dragging, but that's from the knife. There's not much you can do about it. You can't even use a, um, a piece of dental floss or string to stop it from looking like that. But you know, the proof's in the pudding. What's it gonna taste like? Uh, I think, so the, per the paste is, as you can see here, it's runny or, or oozy, which is good. And in the middle, and I think the lipase may have had something to do with this, in the middle, the paste is a little bit firm. It's not chalky, it's just firmer. Now I'm getting ash all over me here because of the top and bottom, and same as this one. Ugh, getting ash all over my cheese. Right, so let's just cut a wedge off. And still, that's still looking very special. Let's try a piece. I'll just get rid of this. Let's just wipe my hands. <laughs> I've got ash all over them. Oh, goodness me. All right, I mean, we definitely need a cracker in the cracker barrel. Just for a little bit later on. Right, so, a couple of crackers. Pop the lid back on there. Uh, now, I'm going to try a bit of the chalky stuff first. I might, I'll just do it here. So the aroma, look, there was a hint of aroma, uh, ammonia when I opened the, the box, but I haven't turned it for a week, so that's probably why. But as far as it holding together, I was a little bit worried about that when I was making it, uh, but it has, look, see, it hasn't fallen apart, which is really good. So let's just taste this bit. Mmm. That is a little bit sharp. You can definitely taste the lipase. So it's going to taste a little bit like goat's milk, um, even though it was made with cow's milk. And I suppose that's pretty good because um, Humboldt Fog, which uh, this cheese is based on, is a goat's milk cheese. So yeah, it tastes a little bit goaty, which is, which is well done. Well done, Patricia, for figuring that out. Mmm, that's nice. So that's the chalky part. Let's try a little bit of the oozy part. So this is a bit spreadable. A bit more there near the rind. And definitely eat the rind. It's got a flavour. You can't taste the ash. The ash is not there as far as flavour-wise. It's just neutral. You can't taste it, and you're not going to get black teeth or anything like that. So don't worry too much about that. Let's try this paste. Mmm. That is lovely. Smooth, creamy. A little bit of goatiness from the, um, the lipase, which is great. Mmm. So that... Um, the oozy paste around the rind is a lot milder than what this, the chalky centre is, which is fine. So the, for this style of cheese, you're getting two flavour profiles for the price of one. So you get that creamy, little bit mild ooziness on, on the, uh, the, what is it, about a centimetre and a half from the edge where the ripening has happened. Not so much on the top because, the top, like I said, the top hasn't been... Um, Infected, well, it's not infected, it hasn't been uh, covered by the white mould, uh, which causes that ooziness in the cheese. So it ripens from outside in. Um, now, what I might do is these ones here, so I've got a bigger one, and you can see, same thing, uh, the tops and bottoms are not covered. But what I'm going to do with those 
is on, and I've got another one, which is the same size as the first one. A little bit of mould growth, but on the sides, perfect. No problems at all. But So what I'm going to do with these ones is I'm going to wrap them in cheese wrap and then put them in the kitchen fridge. And they will mature a lot more slowly. Uh, and I will keep them in a ripening box if there's enough room in the fridge. Otherwise, I'll put them in the most humid part of the uh, kitchen fridge, which is down in the crisper uh, down the bottom. Uh, so I'll wrap those and age them probably for about another 30 days. I want to see how much oozier they go, which will be great. This one's got a little bit of, starting to get a little bit of uh, Penicillium Roque 40. I can see just a tiny bit, but that's okay. It's not going to hurt it. And I can feel this one's quite oozy under the rind. So I will wrap those. However, this one's good to eat now. So maybe I should change the name of the cheese and call it uh, balding fundy fog so because it's got a bald top <laughs> quite cool so if you enjoyed this cheese making video and the subsequent taste test and the tips for making fundy fog uh, and courtesy the recipe of course courtesy of uh, Patricia Gauchi one of the uh, one of the curd nerds in the curd nerd community uh, then give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to get more cheesy content. We're nearly at 300,000 subscribers. So if you've got any friends who are interested in cheese making, then get them to log in with their Google account onto YouTube and uh, subscribe to the channel. And they'll get interesting content as well, of course. Well, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time.